Dr. Kenneth Hughes, Los Angeles, discussing today a little bit about the mommy makeover. What procedures would constitute a mommy makeover? Well, traditionally it's been breast augmentation and tummy tuck. Well, how do you arrive at those two uh, surgeries for something called a mommy makeover? Mommy makeover, by its name, kind of connotes that a person who has had pregnancy, multiple pregnancies and deliveries, is seeking out a makeover or surgeries to improve certain areas of the body. Those areas of the bodies are areas of the body are usually the breast and the tummy because those are the two areas primarily affected by the pregnancy and or the breastfeeding. Okay, so breast augmentation is to help a deflated breast, a breast that has lost mass secondary to the breastfeeding process. And the tummy tuck is to help restore the abdominal wall if there's rectus diastasis or if the skin and uh, uh, resultant kind of trauma from the pregnancy results in loose skin, stretch marks, things of that nature. So you're correcting both of those elements. So the problem with that characterization as a mommy makeover is that frequently that's not what an individual who's had pregnancy needs, or they may need additional procedures. They may not need one of those procedures. For instance, certain people can have multiple pregnancies and still not need a tummy tuck, okay? Their, their abdominal wall may end up being fine and their skin may end up being fine. A lot of this is generated by the, you know, how much weight is gained during the pregnancy, the length of the torso, uh, the size of the uterus, therefore the size of the uh, individual fetus. Those things are very, and then there's a genetic component obviously, uh, which, you know, kind of underlies everything in the universe. But those individuals, you know, may not need a tummy tuck, okay? They may want liposuction, they may not want anything done to their abdomen. In addition, there are people who, you know, with a tummy tuck, that may not be all, all they need. They may need a tummy tuck along with liposuction, along with some fat transfer procedures. They may need, in fact, a circumferential body lift or a lower body lift. They may need an upper body lift. So you can't pigeonhole patients into certain, you know, certain kind of types or whatever, and everybody will need something different. Now, now with regard to the breast, the breast augmentation will certainly fill the upper pole, will help with deflation aspects, but it's certainly not going to lift the breast. And a lot of women after pregnancies and breastfeeding will need breast lifts. And so <laughs> then comes the discussion about scar, you know, the scar averse, okay? So people are have this aversion to scars. Everyone has an aversion to scars, I think, and, and that's just an innate part of our, our being the scars, we don't want to add scars to our body if we don't have to. The problem is, is that the breast, you know, in, in their configuration, as they're drooping, the skin envelope is becoming more lax. That's why you're getting the droopiness. That's why you're getting the vertical elongation. That's why you're getting kind of the sagging, okay? So you're not going to overcome that by filling it up with massive implants. And a lot of times that's done. And, you know, you may be able to get away with it in certain anatomic types, but for the most part, if you need a breast lift, you should do the breast lift. If you don't want the scars for the breast lift, then don't do the breast lift, but don't do a breast augmentation and then have the rest of the breast hanging off, okay? That you know, is called waterfall deformity, snoopy deformity. There are many ways to get generate that deformity, but that's one of the ways. And so that's why when you're talking about the mommy makeover, going back to my original point, it's, it's a question of is it, what procedures does the mommy need, okay? Uh, if, if the mother needs, uh, Breast augmentation, great. If she needs tummy tuck, great. If she needs liposuction, great. If she needs breast lift, great. You can do any number of procedures, okay, and categorize it as a mommy makeover. So it is a little misleading to have cost information and things like that. I do it on my website because I get that question so many times that, some, you know, they may need some kind of price point, but I will say, you know, hey, this, is bre this concerns breast augmentation and tummy tuck. And then if there are differences there, obviously the price would be different. And then I have the other you know, procedures listed on the website as well so that people can make a an educated guess about what they need. Ultimately, in consultation and then subsequent to that, you will get a get an estimate, okay? So that's not something that you should worry about. You know, try to pick the doctor you feel will give you the best possible result or the highest probability for success and go from there. You really don't want to, you know, continue to do these procedures. A lot of the procedures, unfortunately, that I do are revision, okay? So person's had the surgery done, multiple surgeries done, it becomes corrective and reconstructive, and that's not something you want to do. If you, if you can attack it from the very beginning, you have the highest probability of success, okay? If you're trying to correct something else, then you're going to have a lower probability of success. Having said that, does that mean that people who have had poor outcomes are the result of doctors not doing a good job? Absolutely not, and sometimes I have to tell patients when they come into the office, hey, look, you need to get rid of the anger at the previous surgeon because 
obviously you don't understand that not everything is in the surgeon's control. Like I have patients who'll come in and they'll say, look at how bad he made this scar. Well, knowing plastic surgeons as I do, no one really generates a, a you know, a horrific incision in the operating room. Okay, they, they close the incision. It's not like it's wide on the table. That would be literally impossible to generate. You're closing it with suture. Now what happens over time in certain people is the scar widens or something opens and then it has to heal secondarily. All of those things can happen, even in the best of circumstances, okay? So incision separation, opening, wide scar, keloid, hypertrophic scar. Take it from me, I wrote the chapter in Reconstructive Plastic Surgery and Scar and Scar Revision. It can happen, okay? It doesn't matter how perfect something is on the table, and that makes plastic surgery frustrating, not only for the patient, but for the surgeon as well. A lot of the plastic surgeons are very meticulous, perfectionistic tendency people, okay? Type A. And they're trying to generate the best results on the table for the patient by compromising any number of thousands of factors, okay? And it would be foolish to think that somehow, uh, you know, we're leaving stones unturned, okay? We're, we're trying to generate the best result for the patient, but realize that there are problems with the post-op. And that's even in a genetically, you know, maybe a genetically better off, what is that, you know, that kind of doesn't mean a whole lot, but let's say somebody is capable of healing, you know, is closer on the spectrum to a Wolverine, let's say. Yes, that's a made up character, but than say someone with a connective tissue disorder, okay? So people will heal differently, okay? And so that can make some surgeons look really good and some surgeons look really bad, depending upon who you happen to get, what happens to be the protoplasm of that individual. And unfortunately, it's hard to get a glimpse of that before surgery, but you, there are certain things that you can follow afterwards to generate the best result in these mommy makeovers, okay? In mommy makeovers, you're making incisions, okay? You're, you're, let's say you're doing a tummy tuck, a breast dog, and a breast lift. That's a lot of incisional area. The most common thing will be for parts of it to open, okay? Second most common will probably be a fluid collection. Third most common will probably be some sort of maybe infection or, you know, suture abscess, something of that nature. So why do I mention that? I mention that because the things most likely to sabotage you and the surgeon in the post-operative period are fluid collections and incision openings, things of that nature, sutures popping, whatnot. That's just the way it goes with surgery. You're trying to put tissue back together. The tissue is weak at the beginning. It's going to open if you do, if you subject it to sheer stress, if you subject it to the, you know, too much tension, okay? So remember, it's a partnership with the surgeon, and so you you have to kind of be involved for the first six weeks in not doing a lot, okay? Yes, you want to walk around to, pre you know, prevent blood clots, but beyond that, you don't want to do anything else, okay? And you want to take it easy. You don't want to generate a lot of swelling. You don't want to generate fluid collections. You don't want to have the incisions open, okay? That's very, very frustrating as a surgeon to have a perfect result on the table and then have an incision open. It happens, though, and the more surgeries you do, the more times it'll happen. It's not a function of, you know, you improving your technique or whatever on the table. You can only you know, generate the result as well as possible. And then you, you take your chances with the post-operative period and what the patient, you know, how the patient takes care of him or herself. So those are the main issues in the mommy makeover. You're talking about breast dog, breast lift, tummy tuck, okay? And, you know, the, deciding on the candidacy, whether or not it's a mini tummy tuck or a full tummy tuck or a short scar tummy tuck or a floating tummy tuck, all of those things I delve into more detail on the website that could, you know, be several hours long, just that. And then with the breast augmentation, you have several incisional approaches, several types of implants. Also, you can look at for more details on that on the, on the website as well. Uh, there are also many articles that I've written on those subjects, uh, both scholarly or journal articles and, and other articles just for patient information. So, be sure and look at that as well. What I'm trying to give you is I'm trying to educate you to the extent possible so that, you know, not for you to become a plastic surgeon, but to make the information accessible so that there's less trepidation with the surgery, there's less concern, there are fewer questions, etc. This is Dr. Kenneth Hughes in Los Angeles.